here's something that a lot of patients don't understand. Just because you had a gastric bypass does not mean you had the same gastric bypass as another gastric bypass patient. Oh my God, Dr. V, what are you talking about? Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Duck Fong. I'm the number one bariatric surgeon in the world, author of 13 books, working on my, only, my own TV show. Also, I'm going to cure obesity. I'm going to end obesity as we know it. That's my mission, right? Welcome to this broadcast. We're going to talk about the top five gastric bypass myths. And these are all things that I know you've heard and most of you have believed them. And I'm going to explain to you why they're actually myths. Now, if you've had a different surgery, maybe the sleeve or lap band or the duodenal switch, you're probably sitting there thinking, ah, oh, that's why I didn't get a bypass. I didn't want to have that problem. Well, trust me, I'm going to do the top five gastric sleeve myths in a separate video, so keep your eye out for that too. All right, so let's get started. What do you guys think they're going to be? I mean, go ahead and comment. Kind of get this kind of mojo flowing right now and seeing like... See, we can outguess Dr. V. I'm going to start off easy with y'all, right? Easy. All right. Gastric bypass patients. This is number one. Actually, we go backwards. This is uh, number five. We'll, we'll, we'll count down. We'll count down. I'll start off easy. Number five. Gastric bypass patients don't get heartburn that is true or false which one do you guys think that's a big ass myth myth not true you know a lot of patients uh, their surgeons will tell them hey you have you have reflux you have heartburn you don't get a sleeve get a bypass a bypass cures heartburn not true. Bypass patients can also get heartburn, believe it or not. It happens. Not as frequently as gastric sleeve patients. Not as frequently, but they can still get them, and I'm about to explain to you why. And in a separate video, I'll explain to you how you can avoid heartburn in gastric sleeves too. Okay. So I actually have a whole heartburn video. You can check that out on YouTube. But tonight why is this myth so hang with me a little bit here because I got to draw this for you and uh, my red didn't work so good last week so I'm gonna go with blue all right now here's something that a lot of patients don't understand just because you had a gastric bypass does not mean you had the same gastric bypass as another gastric bypass patient oh my god Dr. V what are you talking about there are different ways to perform a gastric bypass. But for the most part, excuse me, for the most part, it's gonna be something like this. So hang with me, we're gonna draw the anatomy, right? Here's your stomach, this is your stomach. And coming down, when you eat something, it goes down your mouth, goes down your esophagus, so this part is your esophagus, right? Here's your diaphragm. Diaphragm, not birth control. No, not birth control. Diaphragm is what makes you breathe. It moves up and down. It's like the bellows of your lungs, okay? Now, this is uh, down here at the bottom is your pylorus. And right here, this is the small intestine, okay? Now, I know patients like it when I get all technical. Because a lot of times, you know, I cuss too much and I don't sound like a doctor. So every now and then when I do a technical talk, people kind of go like, oh, check him out. He might be a doctor. All right. So how are different bypasses different? There are some, there are some main precepts that are similar, but um, the nuances are very plentiful, how different surgeons do different things, okay? So, for example... Your, most surgeons will create the gastric pouch first. Not every surgeon does. I don't think it really matters, but most surgeons will do the pouch first. So they're going to staple off the top part of your stomach. That's it. And you'll be disconnected. That means you're disconnected from the rest of your stomach. You cannot... Here. I'm going to exaggerate this so you can see what I'm talking about, okay? They're going to disconnect your stomach. So now you're totally disconnected, okay? Now... 
So this is what they call your pouch. So I'm going to put in number one here. Number one is going to be a pouch. I didn't mean to get into all this tonight, but I'm just so dang excited drawing anatomy again. Okay. Now listen, under pouch, you can have a long pouch. That looks something like this. That's rectangular. You can have an egg pouch. Looks like an egg. <laughs> circular pouch. There are circular staplers. That gives you a full circle. You can have what's called a micro pouch, which really is no pouch. Micro pouch, which goes from the esophagus oop, and a little tiny cuff of stomach. Really nothing. Now, some of you guys going, man, I, I want a micro pouch. I want a micro pouch. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay, here's the funny thing. No difference in weight loss. Whether you have a long pouch, egg pouch, soaker pouch, micro pouch, no difference in weight loss. But there could be difference in symptoms. And we'll talk about that here in a second. All right. Now, most surgeons are going to then disconnect your small intestine here and bring up the far end, it's called a distal limb, bring up the distal limb and connect it to your egg pouch like that. Okay. And so now when you eat food, it goes down your pie hole. I'm from East Texas, so it's a pie hole. We, <laughs> food goes down your pie hole into your esophagus, into your new pouch, and then goes into the small intestine. This is the jejunum. 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 Small, part of your small intestine. And where they made this connection, now this is reconnected. This is called the gastrojejunoanastomosis, the GJA, GJA. Now because your stomach is still there. Now listen, everyone repeat after me. My old stomach is still there. My old stomach is still there. This is super important because this old stomach is actually called a remnant stomach. Some patients think their surgeon took out their stomach. Now that's a really big surgery. And unless there was something unusual, something concerning, um, you're not going to get your stomach removed. So you still have an old stomach. So your remnant stomach still making stomach juices. We'll make stomach juices. And these stomach juices travel down your small intestine, but now you've been disconnected. Where's it going to go? Well, the surgeon now has to, to reconnect it to the part that he brought up. Right? And this is called the JJ anastomosis. JJA. Why? Jejuno, jejuno anastomosis, right? JJ anastomosis, okay? And I'm going to erase that. I'm going to erase that. And I'm going to make this really look like an intestine. <laughs> All right. Is this interesting or is this boring? If, you, if this is boring, I can go faster. Okay, now, that's number one. Your pouch could be different. Number two, your GJ, ah, G, gastro, jejuno, and GJA can also be different. It can be end to end. So the way I drew it was an end to end. Like, dunk, like when you connect a garden hose to the spigot, that would be an end to end. But there's also an end to side. So what happens in the side, in the side Dr. Bong? Well, instead of connecting in the end, the surgeon will go up there and connect it to the side of the jejunum like that, like in the side. So there is a, what's called a candy cane, like Christmas, like a little candy cane sticking out right over here. Okay. Now, <laughs> so when you do it in the side, now you have a candy cane. Now, some surgeons remove that candy cane. Some surgeons leave a long candy cane or a short candy cane that stretches. We're going to talk about that in a second. Now, this part that he brings up, some surgeons put it underneath the colon. Oh, look, I did that. My first, that's a dirty sign. <laughs> they put it underneath the colon, but most surgeons these days put it over the colon like that. Some surgeons split the uh, omentum, some surgeons don't. But that's the basically most, oh, and then number three, this bypass length. 
So where he disconnected your stomach, or she disconnected your stomach and moved it, those bypass lengths vary. What? I know. It's fucked up. It's messed up. Like sometimes some patients get a longer bypass than another patient. This connection to this distance varies. Like where it's connected varies. So some patients have extreme dumping. Some straight patients have no dumping. Some patients um, dumping return. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Okay. So this is very variable. I know that was very technical. But I just wanted to take some time to spell this out because myth number five, um, most people think that gastric bypass, bypass patients don't get heartburn. I mean, the reality is they totally could. So here's the anastomosis. This little pouch is connected to the genome now. Like a Frankenstein thing. There you go. Okay. Now, why do you get um, heartburn with a, uh, bypass patients? Most commonly, if the bypass patient, like most weight loss surgery patients, aren't really taught how to eat properly, chew slowly, avoid high acid foods, etc., you will get back up. Your food, let me draw food, you eat here and it'll back up and it causes this pain. And that pain can lead to erosion. That food sitting there can lead to erosions and uh, ulcers, right? Also, you could have a complication at this GJA. You could have a stricture. That will cause you feeling like you have heartburn, a lot of pain. And if this candy cane stretches, because that happens too, I've taken out candy cane limbs this long out of patients. Over time, okay, let me go back here. Let me back up. Let's say, let's say your surgeon left you a small candy cane. A little food sits here. And then over the year, years, it stretches. And food stretches here. And then the next thing you know, it stretches again. And now you have this big-ass candy cane. Dr. V is taking something that big out of you when I staple that off. Now, don't ask me why. Surgeons do it that way, and they don't remove it, blah, blah, blah. We don't really know. It's not a fault. And don't be thinking about suing your surgeon. It's just one of these things we're understanding. So this, when food sticks into your candy cane, it's a dead end. It's a blind end. So guess what you're going to feel like? You're going to have a lot of pain. It's going to burn. You're going to hurt, right? Um, and back to ulcers real quick. Ga bypass ulcer is not be bypass ulcer is not like a normal stomach ulcer like if you take too many ibuprofens or NSAIDs um, there is something weird and when we do this and we change the gut flora the bile flow um, stomach acid stomach juices some patients get this really awful bleeding stomach ulcer um, that is very different than regular ulcers. But that can cause a lot of discomfort and heartburn. So that's all I want to say about myth number one. We've gone way too long. <laughs> but was that helpful? Was that interesting? Number four. What do you think it could be? What could it be? All right. This one's going to surprise you. Gastric bypass is not reversible. That is a myth. Woo -woo. So myth. So gastric bypass is absolutely reversible. You can totally reverse a bypass. All that graphic that I just drew for you with anatomy and all that sort of stuff, you can totally undo that. So let me draw that for you real quick one more time. Uh, I have to do it all over again. <laughs> okay, so here's your little stomach pouch. It's been disconnected. You have your small intestine coming back up. What was that called, everybody? G J A, right? And then you have your small intestine connected down here. What's this one called, everybody? J J A. Okay. So a lot of patients go into gastric bypass surgery with this mindset. 
And it's okay to have the mindset, it's just I want you to understand. It's not proper. So they'll go into a gastric bypass and they'll think, like, I wanted permanent weight loss. My surgeon told me it was not reversible. This is the big surgery. Oh, God, that drives me nuts. It's not the big gastric. Don't call it, I'm having the big gastric. No, this shit's reversible. And um, it's reversible, one, is reversible, one, surgically, okay? And believe it or not, it's quite simple. It's a quite simple thing to do. Now, how do you do that? Well, first thing you do is you're gonna disconnect this, so you're gonna get rid of that, anastomosis, okay? You disconnect your GJA, and believe it or not, this will just bloop, flop off to the side, right? Because it doesn't have gravity holding it up anymore. So now it's over here. It's just hanging out over here. No big deal, right? It flopped over. Okay. And now uh, it's flopped over like that. Boop. Yes. I know. Somebody just got a dirty thought in their mind about what this looks like, right? I know. I know what you're thinking. It fell over. I know. Okay, so now once that's done, all you got to do is reconnect this. You just put a stapler here, stapler down the mouth, and reconnect it. So then you just tuk, 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 tuk. Now it's reconnect, reconnected. So now you eat food, it goes down your esophagus, you reconnect it to the stomach, it goes into your small intestine, and it gets digested in the jejunum. Some surgeons might remove this. Most surgeons just leave that thing hanging around. Not gonna hurt anything, nothing to do. It's just a dead end, food won't get there, it'll all drain down, there's nothing to do for it. That's it. It's a pretty simple uh, surgery to reverse your gastric bypass. Right, so number one, you can surgically reverse it. Number two, you can mentally fuck it up too. Oh, my first F-bomb. Reverse it. Do you know any gastric bypass patients who've had gastric bypass, lost 150 pounds, 180 pounds, and then eight years later regained it all, or regained a lot of it? That's what I mean by saying you mentally reversed it. Like you didn't have to have another surgery. And it doesn't matter, you stretched out your surgery, you stretched out your pouch, your surgeon didn't give you enough malabsorption, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter, you haven't had another surgery to reverse it. But if you think about it, if you regained all the weight, your diabetes came back, your blood pressure came back, your aching joints came back, and now you're just five or six years older, in my personal opinion, you've reversed your bypass. True? You see what I'm saying? And I'm gonna tell you, the mental reversal is much worse. It is devastating. And I really hurt and feel for those patients. And the and, and reason why I do these videos and, and the reason why I go speak and give lectures is because I think this is completely avoidable. You can, men, you can surgical weight regain should be 100% avoidable as long as your surgery was done properly to begin with, right? If you get the mental part straight. So we'll talk about myths about the sleeve next time too, but I promise you the gastric bypass is completely reversible surgically as well as mentally. Yes, you can regain all the weight. No, it's not permanent weight loss. It's not weight loss gone forever. Pounds gone forever, bitches! Uh, no, pounds are gone for now. So one of the things is we're gonna change is my diabetes is gone for now. My blood pressure is gone for now. You know, 80 pounds gone for now, not gone forever. It's not gone forever anymore. We need to change that in the community. Cool, was that surprising to people? Were you shocked? I'll be back with the next one. All right, All right. you know, number uh, five and number four were both technical. I drew the surgery for you, all that sort of stuff. Now we're gonna kind of fly through these last few, okay? Uh, myth number three, counting backwards, five, four, three, top five gastric bypass myths. Number five, number three, hunger is gone forever. Now, comment if when you met with your surgeon or your program and they told you, 
Oh, this will be great hunger control. Your hunger will be gone forever. Um, you'll just eat a small amount of food, whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want, just a small amount, and you'll be satisfied. And you won't feel hungry between meals. Comment if you heard them say that. Well, guess what? That shit is a myth. Not true. Not true. Hunger is not gone forever. Just like your weight is not gone forever. Gone for now, man. Gone for now. Now, I'm going to get a little bit technical for you here. This is important you guys understand the bell curve. Now, I learned the bell curve in college. Why? Because at Rice University, where I went to college, they graded on a bell curve, which means, <laughs> which means the curve could help you or the curve could hurt you. But this is going to be measuring your hunger. This is a chart of hunger. Okay? This will be people. There we go. This is what I want. These are years. Okay? So, <clears throat> okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, for example okay and what you're measuring is no hunger all right or uh, return of hunger would be more accurate right so usually um, most people have very good appetite control after bypass for about the first two years most people that's so that's, that's what I wanted here. Two, you know, you get the idea. Um, let's just say two years, okay? Most people have good hunger suppression for the first two years. Now, there are always some, a few people here that their hunger comes back real soon. That says, man, my, my, my hunger suppression only helped, only lasted for one year. Or they'll say, my hunger came back in six months. Or some people, a very small amount of people, will say, I woke up and I was hungry. I never had any hunger suppression. So comment if you're one of those people that just never had any hunger suppression. And then what happens is most people will experience the hunger return around two years. And then there's always a few people, extreme, that five or six years out still have no hunger. Now, why am I explaining the bell curve to you? It's because this is the stuff that we get focused on, the extremes. We're on Facebook, social media. Somebody will post, man, I'm five years out from a bypass, and I, can, I still have to remind myself to eat. Wow. Oh, if only, if only I had more hunger. I wish I had more hunger, then I wouldn't have to log all my food and set my alarms. Remind me when to eat. Wow. Those are people are very rare. But the extremes are the ones that we think um, make the, uh, are the ones that get the most attention, right? So like uh, another example would be um, the biggest loser my 600 pound life like you have to be 600 pounds before you have uh, you get a gastric bypass no no our average patient is only 100 pounds overweight the average patient is five foot five 250 pounds not 600 pounds but it's these extremes that get all the attention i hope i'm making sense right so what's happened is when uh, patients were like when in the early days of um doing the gastric bypass you'd have a few patients return to your clinic and be like dude i'm so I, I have no hunger uh this is awesome i'm losing weight really easy so the surgeons started picking up on that and obviously when they're giving seminars to try to get in more patients um you know one of the main complaints when you're obese is that you're hungry all the time and so the surgeon goes, well, you know, I've got these patients who just don't have, have great hunger suppression, great control. They're losing weight. It's really amazing. It's true, totally true, but that hunger is not gone forever. It will come back. Eventually it will come back, you know. And I've seen it gone for as long as eight, nine years, and it will come back. But here's my point for this. While your hunger is really controlled, that's the time to dedicate to your headspace, the mental side. 
while your hunger is really controlled, that's the time to learn about nutrition, to try different recipes, to try sushi, to try a fish, to try different salads, and to keep your portion small. Small plates, small silverware. Eat slowly. Because that is the time to, that's called the honeymoon period, right? When you're excited about surgery, when weight's melting off you, when you've told everybody on Instagram that you know, you've had weight loss surgery, everybody's watching you, everybody's excited that you're diabetes free, your sleep apnea gone, went away. That is the time to be really dedicated and focused right, on the basics, the, the nutrition, the portion sizes, eating slowly. Why? Because that hunger bitch is coming back. She's coming back, man. She's not gone forever. All right. Okay. So that's a warning for you. It's going to come back, right? Helpful? Good? Be back with the next myth. How about that myth, man? Hunger's not gone forever. It's just gone for now. And while it's gone, take advantage of it. And if it's coming back, don't panic. Don't panic. Just say, hey, it's a natural part of the process. I'm just going to dig in my heels, get back to my basics, get back to the small plates, you know, uh, knock off this five pound of weight regain. Just get your head back in the game. Watch more Dr. V videos. That's all I'm saying. All right, we're back to number. We're number two of five. Number two of five. All right. This one is gonna blow your socks off. Gastric bypass is malabsorptive. In other words, the gastric bypass is a malabsorption surgery. You have malabsorption of your nutrients and your calories, and even when you eat calories, um, uh, it won't absorb all the calories, it won't absorb all the vitamins, the nutrients, it won't absorb all the fats. So you have this malabsorption component. So it's a restrictive component, like you can't eat very much, and it's malabsorptive. Guess what? This, you got it. It's a myth. It's a myth. And 80% of surgeons, eh, maybe not that high, 75% of surgeons agree with me on this. There's another 25 who haven't had experienced this long enough. They are still saying it's malabsorptive. So I will clarify uh, this by saying a couple things. Malabsorption, malabsorption, one varies. Some patients, man, they are really malabsorptive in the sense that like they'll, they'll have bad uh, deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, et cetera, anemias, et cetera. I feel terrible for them. They might have to get IV, TPN, et cetera. That's a surgical issue. Trust me, trust me, trust me on that. Don't hate your surgeon. Work with your team. I'm not trying to be inflammatory, and I feel terrible about patients who are having that issue. But let me talk you through this. So it varies, okay? Most bypass patients will have some form of malabsorption. But Dr. Vong, you just said it's not malabsorptive. That's part number two. Uh, malabsorption in most, and I'm going to say a majority of patients goes away. If you follow out bypass patients far enough, three years, four years, five years, most of their malabsorption part goes away. What? I'll give you an example. I'll prove it to you. Dumping. Comment if your dumping's gone away. You used to have, to, you used to have terrible dumping. You'd eat something really sugary, like a donut. <laughs> Why are you eating a donut? You eat like Girl Scout cookies? Why are you eating Girl Scout cookies? Dr. V, it's my grandbaby's Girl Scout. It's only, it was only one cookie. No, it was one roll of cookies. Uh, well, maybe it was one cookie. Maybe it used to be half a cookie you could eat. But then if you ate the whole cookie, you got dumping. And then a couple year, a year later, you could eat a whole cookie. And if you ate a second cookie, you'd get dumping. And now you can eat four or five cookies before you get dumping. You see the trend? Your body is starting to adapt to this, right? And a lot of times if patients are anemic, they're, it usually resolves if you write it out long enough, okay? 
no, but Dr. Vong, here, some people are going to watch this and say, no, no, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about because I have to take you know, like vitamin D uh, shots. I have to get vitamin B shots. So, all right, all right, hold on, hold on. All right, don't, don't, okay. Now, the question is, if you have vitamin deficiencies, everyone deficiencies is so quick to blame it on malabsorption, but I'm going to tell you this right now. Most vitamin deficiencies are caused by what? You got it. Food sources. Our food sources, even vegetables, have lower levels of calcium and vitamin K and nutrients than they used to because of our farming practices with pesticides and all sorts of stuff like that. We've lost the soil. The soil um, um, uh, ecosphere is completely being disrupted now. So even if you're eating kale, it's not as nutritious as old kale used to be, right? And I'll give you another one. In New Mexico, you know, we're high desert. We're elevated. We're up high. So it is hot outside. So most New Mexicans either use sunblock so they don't get sunburned or they avoid the sun, right? So guess what I see a lot of in New Mexico? That's right. Vitamin deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. Eh, almost everybody is low in vitamin D uh, in New Mexico. Now, that's an environmental cause. That's not a bypass cause, right? So you got food sources. You've got environment that can cause your deficiencies. Environment. Okay. But we're, I would say 75 to 80% of, um, of, uh, surgeons, we're, we're still arguing about it, but most surgeons will say the bypass is only a restrictive surgery. Restrictive surgery. I would say, and we've taken tol uh, polls in our, in our groups, I'd say this is about 25% surgeons think this. I would say 25%. Um, thinks it's uh, restrictive plus malabsorptive. And I'm going to tell you, the other 50% are like me. We think it's restrictive with losing malabsorption. That, that, malabsor that malabsorption goes away long term. So if you're a bypass patient, you're two years out and you've lost your dumping, don't count on a lot of calorie, empty calories going away, man. Just won't. And it goes back again to what I said earlier, like that mindset. Don't reverse your surgery mentally. Don't reverse your surgery mentally, right? Okay, I hope that was useful. Again, this is really being debated right now, but the conversation needs to change in uh, weight loss surgery community. And it starts with the patients. And, I, and, you know, I want you to show this video to your surgeon and say, do you agree with what he's saying? You'd be surprised. Uh, most of them are going to say, I think he's right. It's restrictive and the malabsorption goes away with time. And eventually you're left with just a purely restrictive surgery. And then that goes away too. That's a different topic. <laughs> yeah, your restriction goes away. In fact, your restriction goes away probably before your malabsorption. Amen? Yes? So you got to like really make use of the of this honeymoon phase this time phase when you're losing don't lose momentum keep going cool i'm going to be back with a number one myth you guys ready for the number one myth who's ready for the number one gastric bypass myth ooh this one is going to cause some controversy some controversy gastric bypass is the gold standard Oh, shit. Every time I hear this, I just want to puke. <laughs> it's just not true. And I can't believe we keep saying this and we keep telling patients, have you heard this? Comment if you've heard this. Gastric bypass is the gold standard. This is a fucking myth. It's not true. Not true, okay? And I'm about to explain why it's not true, okay? Now, 
I know I'm primarily a sleeve patient. Now I believe in the bypass. The bypass is a good surgery. It works. And I'm going to do a separate video on sleeve myths. So don't get me wrong. But let me just give you the data. All right. Again, if you're talking about excess weight loss, which means you got to look at your BMI of 40. That usually qualifies you for weight loss surgery. That's about 100 pounds overweight. And as surgeons, we're trying to figure out your excess weight loss percentage. That's how we determine um, as good as your surgery is going. So it's how much are you overweight by with a BMI of 25 to a BMI of 25. Okay. So if you have a BMI of 40, you're roughly 100 pounds overweight. Roughly. Okay. So if you have a gastric bypass, hold on. So let's say, let's say your BMI is 40 and you want to sleeve about five years after a sleeve and you're 100 pounds overweight, how much weight have you kept off? Of the 100 pounds that you were overweight, how much of that did you keep off? Five years after, it's about 60 to 62%. 60 to 62 percent. So if you're 100 pounds of weight, in other words, you would have kept off 60 pounds. If you were 200 pounds overweight, you would keep off 120 pounds because 120 is 60 percent of 200. Make sense? You know, so see, it's not it's not 100 pounds. It's not 100 percent. Most likely. This is average. Average. Are there people who lose 100%? Yes. I've got lots of patients who've lost 100%. Do some patients lose more than 100%? Yes. Do some patients lose 100% and then regain it all? Yes. Yes. That's why they call it statistics. But on average, you're, you're, you can expect, because this is what your surgeon is going to tell you, because otherwise they'd be lying. They have to kind of report what you can expect statistically average norms you can expect to keep about 60 pounds off but dr vong that's why i got the big gastric the big i hate that the big gastric Ugh. okay that's why i got the big gastric uh gastric bypass because i wanted all the weight loss off I wanted the big one. I wanted to be fully committed. This was my only one and only chance, Dr. V. Well, if you're 100 pounds overweight and you had the gastric bypass, five years after, what do you think you keep off if you have a bypass? What's the average? What do you think? Average. About 62 to 65%. So basically, it's the basically the same they are statistically the same not significant difference the sleeve and the bypass weight loss results five years out are statistically not different bypass yes is a little bit better but it doesn't make it a better surgery so in other words if you're 100 pounds overweight with a bypass you keep off about 62 to 65 pounds and same thing, if you were 200 pounds overweight, someone double that for me, 124 pounds compared to 120 pounds. Not that big of a difference. Four pounds when you are 200 pounds overweight is not that big of a deal, y'all. I know you, every pound is precious. We love it. But when you talk about statistics, it's not that big of a deal. Does that make sense? In fact, the gold standard, if you really want to know what the best, and I don't like the term gold standard, but if you want to say the best surgery, Dr. Vaughn, what's the best surgery? What's the one that's going to give me the best results? No, 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 that's the wrong question. Yo, I love you, but that's the wrong question. Question needs, it depends on what you're measuring. So pretty much 99% of surgeons, the best surgery for weight loss is actually the duodenal switch, the DS, the switch. And for diabetes resolution, again, the DS. But, Dr. Vong, I should have gotten the, I should have gotten the duodenal switch. I should get the switch. Uh, it has the highest death rate. 
It has about 10 times the death rate as a bypass. 10 times! Man, it has a high death rate. There's a steep learning curve. It's got a lot of side effects. It's got a lot of malabsorption. All the surgeons agree the DS is malabsorptive. You're going to be, you know, the average is about five loose bowel movements a day, but some patients get away with three, two or three. But most patients can be as bad as eight diarrheal movements a day, a lot of nutritional deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, and that's assuming you survive the surgery. And you can also regain all your weight with the DS. So it's not permanent, y'all. You know, which is kind of the point of this broadcast, which is you can't fall for this stuff anymore, right? What you're starting to see is it's all the hard work. It's the mental side. It is the getting rid of negative people. It is learning new skills. It's trying new foods. It's trying new recipes. Let me ask you this question. Why did you have weight loss surgery? There's only one right answer. And even though most likely I've never met you, I can tell you this is the only right answer. Why did you have weight loss surgery? Answer is because you wanted your life to change. You didn't do it for your kids. Don't be blaming shit on your kids. I did it to be around for my kids. No, because when something bad happens and you're stressed out, you blame your kids. Not true. It's not for your husband. It's not because you wanted to get healthier. You wanted your life to change. Follow me now. If you wanted your life to change, then why won't you let go of all the shit that, is, that made you fat to begin with? Fried foods, fast food, snack, and eating all the time. Trying to not be hungry. Trying to not be hungry got you fat. Snacking between meals is what got you fat. So why are you doing it now after weight loss surgery? My program told me to. What if your program's wrong? Dr. Vaughn tells you not to snack. I, my patients do not snack. You wanted your life to change, which means... Why are you still in that same shitty job, barely getting by? Don't like your boss, don't like your coworkers, bringing home stress from work and working at home even though you don't like it. Why are you in a, still in a passionate relationship? And it's okay that, it, that you don't have the same spark or passion now. Why aren't you working on it? Why aren't y'all talking? Why aren't y'all communicating? Why aren't y'all traveling? All this stuff. Why did you want to lose the weight? Dr. Vong, I wanted to travel. Well, then get your ass off the couch. Start meeting new people. Getting rid of negative people. Well, it's, you know, it's my mother-in-law. I can't get rid of my mother-in-law. Yes, you can. You can get rid of your mother, your stepfather, your crazy aunt, your uncle, your bestie. They all need to go because they all got you fat most likely. That's the hard truth. But that's a life truth. We always want to up-level. We always want to move on. We always want to accomplish more. Some people were surprised a year ago when I announced that they were closing down my program and I decided to retire from surgery. There was nothing wrong. Very good surgeon. Never took anybody back for a complication, surgical complication in four and a half years at my last program. So I was a very good surgeon. But my dreams got too big for the OR. I'm Dr. Duck Lung. I've written 13 books. I've got a lot of YouTube videos. I am going to cure obesity. With your help, we are going to end obesity. I love you very much. I'll see you next time.